Well, this morning, on behalf of our pastor and our first lady, uh, I wanted to share this message. It's been a message that has been, for lack of better words, burning on the inside of me. But first, I want to start with the last, I would say, uh, the last stage of revelation for, for this message for me. Indulge me, it's a quick story. So uh, about a week and a half, maybe two weeks ago, I found myself at a, state, at a reading, at a reading for scripts. As actors, one of the great opportunities to work with new writers and to work with directors is you have these things uh, where people will gather and say, I've got this script, I need actors to read it, so I participated. And it was enlightening, to say the least because I believe it, the, at the root of it was the point of, of today's message. And so I found myself reading this script. There were two of them. One of them was fantastic. It was amazing. It was one of those where you're just like, I don't care what it is. I don't care if I have to serve craft services donuts. I want to be a part of this particular piece. And then there was a second piece which I found myself reading, which was, how can I put this? well outside of who I am as a person. <laughs> well outside of the things that I stand for as a person. Well outside of the things God has called upon me to be. Well outside of the things God has called upon me to say. And well outside of the type of person God has called me to be an example of. Now it's a fascinating place to be in because I would love to tell you that the Holy Spirit rose in me, and I said, no. <laughs> and I walked out the door, and just holy fire was behind me, and just burnt everything behind me. <laughs> That's what happened in my mind. <laughs> but what really happened was I was reading this script saying things I would never say in an environment that had suggestions spiritually that are completely anti what I stand for and who I am, and I read it. And as it's happening, it was the most, there's passages in script, there's a passage in scripture which speaks of, of Jesus having a groaning a groan in his bowels. And it was, a, it, was a, it was a groan in his bowels which was based on the misery he was feeling in that moment. I understood the passage mentally, but spiritually and physically, I now know what that felt like. And so I've, I've read this script and it was, it was the weirdest out of body experience. It was like me looking at me going, what are you doing? What is going on? And I realized in that moment a couple of things. One, I'm not the only person who has faced this. If you have found yourself in a position where you are acting for whatever reason, I don't mean acting as in the craft of acting, I mean acting as in your actions as a person, as a human being, where you find yourself acting well outside of who God has called you to be, if you know what that feels like, just Hmm. You don't need to raise your hand, just hmm. And so I read this script and I said, man, this is the darkest, craziest, why am I reading this? And it was finished. I prayed it off of me. <laughs> they were like, let's reread it again. I was like, no. We will not read this again. I don't even want to admit I read it the first time. <laughs> so we finished, I go home to my wife, and it was late, and so I tried to, <laughs> I tried to kind of brush the situation past. I tried to pretend it wasn't as severe as it was, but I couldn't sleep. It was still bothering me. Got up the next morning. Now the crazy part about the next morning is, I gotta pray. I had to pray. This is a Wednesday night deal, Thursday mornings. I'm part of the intercessory team. 
for the, for the uh, worship team. So Thursday morning, I've got to come with a clean and pure heart and pray and intercede on behalf of my worship team. But the night before, I'm well outside of who God has called me to be. And I'm faced with this moment where when I tell you literally I wanted to quit, the groan in me was so deep. I was like, I don't know if I ever want to act again. I was ready to take this gift and say, if the gift comes with this, I don't want it. I'm 38 years old, that's the first time in my life I have ever said I wanted to take the gift that God gave me and literally pull it out of me and put it away because it was just, I couldn't deal. But I realized that it had to be deeper than that. I did not go through that experience just to quit. Thank goodness I have an amazing praying wife. She laid the hands on me. Start talking to God and said, this is not going to stick. This is not going to stick. This is not going to stay. This is who you are. Man of God, talked over me, spoke over me. And I realized in that moment that what was happening was not designed to make me quit. What was happening was designed for me to re-examine the relationship I had with my gift. Because in that moment, it wasn't that I had forgotten who Jesus was. It wasn't that I had forgotten who Jesus stands for. It wasn't that I forgot the principles or I forgot the power of Jesus or the power of the resurrection or the power of the Holy Spirit. I, for that brief moment, had completely, completely misunderstood the relationship between me and my gift. I had gotten so close, so I had my hands so tight around the gift that I literally thought I was the gift. My identity had become so bound up in this gift that God had given me that I thought I was it. So as I'm reading this script, it almost was a feeling of if I don't read this, then I'm not an actor. And if I'm not an actor, who am I? Does anyone else know what I'm talking about? It doesn't have to be acting. But when you become so close to your gift, you become so entangled in your gift, you think you are your gift. You think as your gift is, so are you. You think as your gift is expressed, so are you. As your gift is used, so are you. And as your gift is not used, so are you. The title for tonight's message, this afternoon's, this morning's message, I'm going into the future and backwards. <laughs> I had already fast forward to Wednesday night, 1 p.m., 11, I'm at the 9, I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. The title for this message is, You Are Not Your Gift. One of the scariest things about the discovery of our gift is the idea and the fact that it is on the inside of us. And we have such a tight claim on what's inside of us. We, it is a part of who we are, yes. Just like everything else on the inside of us is a part of who we are. But I am not my liver. I am not my intestines. I am not a kidney. Those are a collection of organs that make up a part of who I am. And so it is the same relationship that we need to have with our gift. You are not your gift. It's interesting because, especially as artists, we get dramatic. We say things like, if I don't do this, I feel like I would die. If I don't act, oh my God, I would die. If I'm not singing, oh my God, I would just die. If I'm not writing, oh, I'm going to die. And in the moment, you're gripped with the passion of it and you're gripped with the, the commitment. I get the spirit behind it. It speaks to how committed you are to the use of your gift. I get that part. 
But I want to make sure everyone who's receiving this message and everyone who's here right now, make sure you don't say that again. Don't speak a premature death over yourself. Really? You're going to die if you don't do this thing? What we don't understand when we say something like that is what we're speaking forward over ourselves. We are literally speaking ourselves out of the proper alignment between our identity and our gift. There is a way to be passionate about that which you do, that God has blessed you to do, that God has specifically created for you to do. I get being passionate about it. I get loving it. I get loving being used by God with this gift. All well and good. I'm not trying to take that from you. What I want to take away from you is the association, the immediate association between your identity and your gift as if they are the same. Because your gift is just a part of who you are. There is so much more to who you are that goes well beyond your gift. Think about the statement, if I don't write, I would die. Is anybody in this room right now writing? <laughs> Y'all ain't dead, are you? <laughs> well, I guess it ain't true. It's a crazy thing to realize. We become so in love with the gift that we tie our identity to the gift to the point where they meld into each other. And in our minds, they cannot be extracted from each other. It's a dangerous trap because God has called you to be so much more than your gift. <laughs> to the point where you are living and breathing outside of your gift. You're doing it right now. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. You're here. Can you imagine if I said to myself all the time, if I don't act, oh my God, I would die. Well, where does, my, where does that leave my wife and son? How do I explain that to them? Baby, you know what? Check it, life is beautiful, it's wonderful. Little chubby baby who's not talking yet. Life is amazing, but check it. Daddy hasn't auditioned in a week. I need to go in this corner and die real quick. <laughs> Y'all just hang out. Does that make any sense? No. And yet I found myself in this position where I had to really look at it and say, there is, there is a dysfunctional aspect here. It's not the gift, it's my relationship to it. So I want to look at a couple of passages in scripture that highlight where the relationship with the gift is wrong and where the relationship with the gift is right. We're going to start with Judges 13 and 15. Now Samson, as we all know in the Bible, is the strongest man in the Bible. Many people know Samson for his strength. When I first heard of Samson, of course, the first thing I think of is Samson and Delilah. Yeah, he messed up with the woman. We get it. But almost everyone who knows Samson, even for people who don't necessarily read the word as much, know Samson strength, Samson muscles, Samson break, rah. Samson was a judge. And in this passage, we see who Samson was really supposed to be. It says, for behold, now this is an angel of the Lord speaking to Samson's parents. So Samson's not born yet. So his identity has been shaped and formed before he was born. I hope someone catches that. Your identity, who you have been purposed and planned to be, and all that you are purposed and planned to do according to God's will, preordained. It looks like this, for behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and no razor, razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. I'm going to examine a couple of words. Just hold that up there for me. Thank you. Now, the Nazarite vow was one where you became separated for God, which means the rest of the world acts like this. You act like this. Samson, before he was born, was separated for God. The Nazarite vow included three things. One, you don't touch dead bodies. Two, you don't cut your hair. Three, you don't drink wine or anything like wine. 
But we'll go to the hair thing. Later on in this, in this story of Samson, you will find that his hair gets cut and he loses his strength. And it's interesting, in that passage, most people will focus on the hair being cut as if the hair was the strength. Even Samson, when Delilah asked him, what is the source of your strength? He said, it's my hair. If you cut my hair, I won't be strong anymore. But if you look here at what God said over him before he was born, he was set aside according to the Nazarite, Nazarite vow. His power was not in the hair. His power was in the vow. His power was not in the glorious locks that he had. Because if this was the case, I would have no power at all. And I would be a sad, sad man. <laughs> but I know there is power in these follicles that are trying to grow. I know. I know there's power. But he thought his power was in his hair. His power was, be, is, was being separated for God's purposes before birth. And, the, and according to the vow, these were the three tenants. And one of those tenants was violated. He lost his power. Now, Samson was called to be a judge. Now, this is a period in time where the people of Israel were led by judges. And instead of kings, because the people of Israel had a heart to continuously test God, and they were stiff-necked, and they were stubborn, and could not only worship God, they just had to worship everything else but God, they couldn't help themselves, God brings the people to a place where they are now in the hands of their mortal enemies, the Philistines. And so the judges period in Israel is where these people are set aside to lead Israel to deliver them from the hand of their captives. Now you look up the word deliver, and it's a he the Hebrew word for deliver in this translation is yasha. Love this. It's to be open, to be wide, or to be opened wide, or to free. And then we have avenge and defend as well. But I want to make sure we concentrate, because we're going to come back to this later, to open wide and to be free. Samson's purpose was to open the hand of the Philistines so that his people could be delivered. Samson was a judge. Yet, Samson's highlights, we're not going to go through all of them, but you can read them on your own time. Judges 13, 14, 15, and 16. Samson's, for someone who had supernatural strength, known as like the strongest man in the Bible, his story was short. You look at Abraham, long story. Jacob, long story, as he becomes Israel, long story. And then you get to Samson and you're like, well, with all of this super strength, why is your story so short? You see that his story is so short because there's not much to it. Samson, his job, his purpose, his being was to deliver Israel from the Philistines. All Samson did with his gift was break stuff, and fight. Samson was his gift. Samson's purpose was to free his people. All Samson did, I'll break down the pattern of Samson very quick for you. Samson meets a woman. Samson does something with a feat of strength. And then he goes, kills some Philistines because based on him meeting the woman he wasn't supposed to be with, drama broke out. This happened three times. Three consecutive times, he would meet a woman, feet of strength. Oh, I, I almost left out the riddle. Samson loved riddles. This is what we know about someone who's called to deliver people. He loves women. He loves riddles. He's really strong. No deliverance. This is what happens when you become your gift. When you become your gift, when your identity is literally in your gift, when all you know about you is your gift, the purpose and the plan that God had for you, that God spoke over you before you were born, cannot be done because you're so focused on breaking things and having riddles. So Samson is the perfect example of the relationship with the gift gone horrifyingly wrong. Even his last act, it is said in his last act, 
He was placed between two pillars. He pushes the pillars apart. This uh, temple falls and it crashes and it kills more Philistines than he ever killed in his whole life. It's heroic. But if you examine why it is that he did it, it wasn't because he was trying to deliver his people. He did it because he was angry. He was angry because the Philistines, after his hair gotten cut off, Philistines got a hold of him, disrespected him, took his eyes out, and he was angry. And it was from this place that he managed to kill more Philistines than he ever killed. The reason Samson can be seen as, not to judge the judge, but the reason it can be seen as a disappointment is because he had so much more over his life than what he did. He was given supernatural strength. And yet, he did not ultimately fulfill all that God called him to do because he didn't understand he was more than his hair, he was more, <clears throat> excuse me, he was more than a jawbone, he was more than the honey in the carcass. He was supposed to be a judge. Now, I want to look at an example of the relationship with your gift gone right. And there were many, many gifted people in the Bible. Supernatural things took place through God's people. But this encounter for me is the foundation of what our relationship with our gift really needs to be like. Let's go to Exodus chapter three. Now at this stage, Moses has been commissioned by God to go free his people from the hand of Pharaoh. Moses was not a perfect person. In fact, it was ironic that of all people chosen to lead, one of the characteristics and qualities you need for leadership is patience. Moses had very little. One of the things you need that, that you need that people would think that you would need anyway to lead is to be a charismatic speaker. You need to be able to speak to the people and have them hear you. Moses had a speech impediment. And yet God calls Moses forward and says, yeah, you, not everybody else, you. I want you to do this amazing and supernatural thing. You're going to go to the Pharaoh you're gonna tell them to let my people go and then you're gonna to go to my people and you're gonna tell them that I'm gonna free them. I love Moses' response because he's so humble. Come now therefore and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Yes. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. We're gonna pause right there. So Moses gets called to do this supernatural crazy thing, and his first question is a pretty decent question. Who am I to do this? But Moses wasn't asking who am I as in, what's my name and what's my lineage and what's on my driver's license? Like he knew who he was. What he's really asking in this moment is what are my qualifications? How am I qualified to do this? In other words, God, what gifts inside of me, what talents have you placed inside of me to be able to do this incredible thing that you're asking me to do? So Moses is doing what we would all do in this situation. God calls you to do something that blows your mind. You say, wait a minute. What have you put in me that's going to enable me to do this? So basically, Moses is asking God to fill out his resume for him so he can read it and feel good when he goes in for the meeting. <laughs> I love God's response. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Go to the next verse. So he said, <laughs> I will certainly be with you, period. I tell you, God is the best comedian. He tells the greatest jokes. This poor man said, listen, you about to send me to Pharaoh who's killing people left and right. I can't really talk straight. <laughs> you want me to talk to Pharaoh, I can't even get my words right. You want me to lead these people, you know I don't have patience. I barely got patience with me. You want me to lead these people. And when I ask you what it is I can do, you just tell me I'm gonna be there. <laughs> Word God, that's how this is going to be? Okay, you got jokes. <laughs> so he said, I will certainly be with you. 
This right here is the relationship with your gift you need to have. So many times when God calls us to do something amazing, the first thing we want to do is find out all the capabilities of our gifts. What have you given me to do, God? Can I write? Can I build? Can I construct? Can I draw? Can I sing? Can I talk? Can I walk? What can I do? And God is like, eh, eh. I'm with you. That's it. That's it. It doesn't matter how great your gift is, how sharp it is, how much you work it, how much you can spin it, how much you can flip it, how you can show it to anybody. It doesn't matter. None of those things matter if God is not with you. It doesn't mean a hill of beans if you look up and God is like, "Mm -mm." (laughs) mm-mm. And we'll try him too. We get used to using the gifts and the talents and we've mastered them and we've shaped them and we've worked on them and then we get into a situation and where it's time to use those gifts and talents and we're so ready to go, we'll just start working. And God is like, were you, were you not gonna check in? What, what's, what's going on? Really? You're just gonna move forward and not ask me anything? I'd like to think I know I built that. And in fact, I know your gifts better than you because I built you. So there's nothing that you could do right now that's going to be greater than what I could authorize you to do. The best relationship you can have, the most grounded, the most spiritually powerful, the most, uh, the most anointed relationship you can have with your gift is the one where you say, God, are you with me? Because once he's with you, everything else gets answered. All the questions about you you and your gift get answered real swift. So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Next verse. I love Moses. He was like, ha ha, okay, you're with me. I get it. But then Moses said, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, what is his name? What do I say to him? (laughs) Again, logical question. You want me to go to these people. You know what I sound like. You know I don't look the part of a leader. And you want me to walk into these people, the room with these people, and tell them not only that they're going to come with me, but you want me to tell them it's because you said so. Who should I tell them that you are? So the first passage is interesting because he's asking, the first exchange that he has where he says, who am I? He's asking for the resume for him. What are my abilities? What are my gifts and talents? What are the things that I can do? The second one, he took it a step further. He said, God, who are you? What are these things that you can do? Since you're going to be in the room with me, you're going to handle this. (laughs) Who are you? What is your name? What can I tell these people about you so that they will go, oh, yeah, let's roll. This is God. God could have laid his resume out. I mean, by the time he would have been halfway through the first portion of Genesis, Moses would have been dead. His list of qualifications is that long. I love God's response to this. You want to know? Okay, I'll tell you. And God says to Moses, <laughs> I'm telling you, God is the greatest comedian ever. God says to Moses, <laughs> I kind of feel bad for Moses in this moment, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> God says to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I <laughs> I am has sent me to you. This is proverb heaven. Like, wow. 
And this sounds like a very coy response until you look up the definition of am as it is used in this text. Am, this word am in the Hebrew is, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, ha ya, ha ya, excuse me. It's to exist, we get that. To be, we get that too, my favorite part. To come to pass. So when God said, tell him I am who I am, he literally was saying, all of existence, all of eternity, all of the power it took to create eternity from alpha to omega is showing up with you right now. In other words, I am not trapped within the confines of your situation. I am the coming to pass of your situation. You are bringing the coming to pass in to whatever difficult thing you are about to encounter. I'm not bringing the, the hurdle. No, 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 no. I'm bringing over the hurdle. That who's, is who's coming in, those are my qualifications. I am. I'm well beyond. I'm not just redeemer, restorer, provider, good father, creator. I'm all of that and everything outside of it that is, was, and ever will be. That's what's coming with you. If you would just take the time to not be so worried about your gifts. If you would just take the moment to breathe and check in and say, are you with me? Yes. Then more than my gift is coming into this circumstance, more than my gift is encountering the opportunity, what's coming with me is the coming to pass of the interaction between my gift and the opportunity. What's coming with me is overflow. What's coming with me is overcoming. That is what's coming with you when all you do is look up and say, God, are you with me? Moses got it right, and I love that Moses got it right early because, Lord, he needed it. He had to lead these people through the wilderness. They complained and complained and complained, and he complained a little bit too. But without this relationship, he wouldn't have made it through the, he wouldn't have made it to the wilderness. But he understood, God had to get him to understand, I've commissioned you to do these great things, but before you get started, you need to understand something. I am is with you. You are not doing this by yourself. You have all of eternity with you. The beautiful part about this moment right here is everything that Moses does afterward is amazing. Moses is known as one of the great leaders of our time because of this exchange and everything that came after it. But you can't have that until you have the knowledge and the root understanding that you are not your gift. So then, if I know who I am, and I know who God is, in this little equation that we've set up this morning, what's the point of the gift? Let's take a look. Let's go to Proverbs 18, Proverbs 18 and 16. One of my favorite passages. Y'all are like, man, he says that about every passage. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> it says, a man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. This is true. This is true. It's, I love how God makes it so simple. Yeah. This is the purpose of your gift. Your gift is not to make people feel good. Your gift is not to make you feel good. 
The purpose of your gift is to make room for you and bring you before great men. I love that if you think, if you can picture this, there is a very physical and obvious separation between the person and the gift. This right here tells us, it shows us, it crystallizes exactly the alignment that is supposed to take place between God, us, and the gift. So the gift goes forward and it literally creates a space for you. Think of your gift as, have you ever gone into a room and you need to get someone's attention? You hear people go, and I won't do it in the mic because it's one of the rudest things ever. But <clears throat> you clear your throat. And then you, you need to make sure that they can hear you so you, <clears throat> you clear your throat a little louder. And then at some point you do that really uncomfortable, uh, uh, and it's just awkward, but you got everybody's attention, it worked. Your gift is the clearing of your throat. Your gift is designed to wake people and get the attention. Your gift is designed to wake the universe and get the attention of the universe that you are about to make your way through. That's the point of your gift. Your gift is not so that you can ball till you fall. <laughs> now, if you happen to in the process, so be it. But that's not the point of the gift. I love this relationship because you can literally see it. Once you have someone's attention, say something. Once your gift has made the way and has created this space for you to walk through, say something. Two instances that, that come to mind in terms of current events. There's a quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers. Y'all know I gotta talk sports, I love sports. There's a quarterback for the, the, the San Francisco 49ers. His name's Colin Kaepernick. You may or may not have heard of him. It's fine if you haven't, I'll tell you about him. <laughs> Quick history, this guy, three, four years ago, was one of the best quarterbacks in the league. I mean, like top two or three. He almost won my fantasy league for me, so he, he hooked me up. He's real. This guy was one of the greatest quarterbacks in the league. Through injuries or whatever, he manages to not only lose his job, he's still with the same team, but now he's a backup. But here's the interesting thing. While he was leading his team to a Super Bowl, while he was playing in the Pro Bowl and filled with the endorsements and doing the commercials, he had a fraction of the influence a fraction of the influence he has right now. His gift is to play football. That's obvious from what you've seen. But he is not his gift. Right now, his voice has reached infinitely more people because he has used his voice, his voice as an extension of who he is on the inside and what he stands for to take a social stance by kneeling during the national anthem. Whether you agree with it or not, not the point. He's used his voice, his gift created the space. All those years of throwing and running for touchdowns, he had no idea it was setting him up to do this. He thought he was just going, you know, be the best quarterback ever. He may still well be. But I find it so fascinating because if he identified with his gift as we tend to, he could say, I'm a football player. All I do is play football. I don't take social stances. All I do is play football. I would die if I didn't play football. <laughs> Here's the beauty of it. This year, he took this social stance his jersey's the number one seller in the league. <laughs> Hilarious. All the great things he's done this year, the year he speaks and uses his gift as a platform, is the year he gets the most attention, and he's using that attention to bring it to a very, very critical part of our society that needs to be highlighted. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the best part about the gift. 
He has not played a down of football all year. He hasn't said hi. He has been holding that clipboard like a champ. All year long. Might not start a game this whole year. And yet, his sphere of influence is greater than it could have ever been while he was while he was doing all that. My point is this, don't be so focused on your gift that you don't take your eye up to see the space that it has made for you. And then check in with God and say, now God, what do you want me to do with this space? That is the proper alignment between God, us, and the gift. I think about how me and my wife got together. <laughs> Somebody's like, yeah, I want to hear the story. What I find so fascinating about how me and my wife got together was, as I'm fond of telling the story, when I met her, the first thing that jumped out about her was who she was. Who she was. I mean, she's fine and all, and listen, and twisted. I saw that too. I'm not blind. I have vision. Okay, I have vision. <laughs> but the first thing that jumped out about her to me was who she was. When I fell in love with my wife, now most people here know of my wife. She actually spoke a couple weeks ago. Gifted, gifted speaker. Incredible speaker, anointed voice. Yeah. Anointed voice. So you would think with a gift like that, if she was really trying to get me, she would just sing to me and I would just fall out and be in love. <laughs> Made sense. Except here's the funny part about it. I was three quarters of the way in love with her before I ever heard her sing. I didn't even know she was a singer when I met her. It was months after she sang, and I said, <laughs> but I was already most of the way there because she is not her gift. I didn't fall in love with my wife because she's a great singer. I fell in love with my wife because she's a great person. I'll even tell the other side of that story. When she met me, she didn't know I acted. She didn't know I was an actor. The one time she saw me act, to be honest, it wasn't that good. <laughs> I can say that now. You know, at the time, you, your feelings all in it. But <laughs> it was not that great. But she still fell in love with me regardless. Can you imagine? <laughs> My son was like, yes! And I am the fruit! Ha ha ha! <laughs> Can you imagine what would have happened if we were just waiting for each other to express each other's gifts to fall in love? Wow. I can't fall in love with you. I need to see I need to see your gift first. Oh, you are your gift? Then I need to see your gift. So if my wife isn't singing, I'm not in love with her. And if I'm not acting or preaching, then she's not in love with me. How'd that work? Where'd they do that at? <laughs> there has to be a clear and concise separation between who you are and your gift. In fact, I will say this, the best way to preserve and protect and grow and mature your gift is to find out who you are outside of it. When you're not strumming the guitar, when you're not playing the keys, when you're not in the stock market on the broker room floor, yelling out whatever it is that they yell out when stocks and bonds get exchanged, I don't know what that thing is, but you know what I mean, you've seen it, Wall Street, you know. When you're not doing that thing that you know God has called you to do, who are you? The only way your, your gift will grow is if you develop and nurture the relationship of who you are outside of it. 
Because once you become your gift, it becomes a curse. When you become your gift, it will kill you. It will kill your destiny to become your gift, to become it. Because at some point, you are not doing your gift. And you're going to feel like, oh, I just want to die. And if you say that enough times over yourself, spoke about this on Wednesday night, if you say that enough times over yourself, you'll start to feel like you are dying. So we'll look at Proverbs 18, 16 again. <gasps> A little bit of time, I'm going to keep going. A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. I love the image because the understanding we need to have about our gift, PT has been speaking over and over the past two weeks about expansion. See, what happens when you express your gift is your gift has expanded on the inside of you. God has touched your gift on the inside of you in such a way that it causes it to expand. So your gift expands and it expands and it expands and you expand around it. So your gift is growing. It is not you, it is a part of you. And here's why it's important. Once we understand that it is not a part of you, then we can let it go. I can't express it if I think I am it. So your gift is inside of you. God touches it, it grows, you grow, and then you hit critical mass. Critical mass is where one of two things needs to happen. You either need to express this gift or if you don't express the gift, it will shrink inside of you and you will shrink corresponding to it. That's why it's so critical to be in touch with God and say, are you with me? Because when you know you're with him, he'll let you know now, 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 express it now, get it out now, 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 now. You cannot wait right now. This is critical mass. You have expanded to capacity for this season. You've expanded to capacity for the opportunity in this moment. Right now, right now, right now. Get it out, get it out, get it out, get it out. And anybody who is in touch with their gift knows that feeling. It'll keep you up at four in the morning. You can't sleep. You have three books in you. You only have one pen. What am I going to do? Figure it out but you get those three books out of you. I've got this script in me, I gotta write it right now. Because if I don't write it right now, I won't submit it right now. If I don't submit it right now, the person who's waiting for it to receive it won't get it. And if they don't get it in the right time, everything that's supposed to happen isn't gonna happen. It has to happen right now. But that only happens when God reaches inside of you and touches the gift. Because we've opened ourselves up enough to allow him to touch the gift. And we know that when he is touching the gift, He's not taking us. When you become entangled and so about the gift that you think you are the gift, you won't let it go because you literally feel like you're giving up who you are. You're not giving up who you are. You're giving up the portion of who you are that God has blessed you to have. So you expand. You expand. You hit critical mass. Now you express the gift. When you express the gift, it goes out into the universe and it creates a nice size cutout. And that cutout, that space, that room that has been created by your gift is prepared precisely to fit the enlarged version of who you are because the gift, remember, has enlarged and you have enlarged with it. So it's designed to fit that space and you are to walk through that space. And when you walk through that space, you will find that you will, be, you will have been brought before great men. Too many times, our gift makes the room for us. And if we don't know who we are, we will see the space that the gift has made for us and say, that's too big. That's so much bigger than who I am. How could I possibly fit through something that big? That's why it's so important. You are not the gift. The gift says a man's gift makes room for him. If you become your gift, all you will do is make room 
But if you are the gift and you've made the room, who's going to walk through? You're the gift, right? But here's what happens. If you become so entangled in your gift, you will make room and God will say, well, since there's no one else to walk through, someone else can. Because the space has been created. If you don't want to be in contact with who you are, if you don't want to be in touch with who I'm telling you, the completeness of who you are, that's cool. But there's a space and there's some hungry people behind you who can't wait to walk through that space. I'm going to touch that gift in that person, enlarge and expand them, and they will fit just like that and walk right on through. Now we're living a life where our gift is making room for other people. And we can't understand why we can't walk through it. People just, another space, another hole. And your gift is just making room for people. People are skipping the whole way through. You putting in mad work with your gift, but you can't walk through it because you made yourself your gift. Man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. Every time I've read that verse, I get excited. I say, all right, God is going to take my gift. He's going to make room for me, and I'm going to walk through, and I'm going to be before great men. Let's look at this verse very carefully. A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. A man's gift. If the purpose of my life is to be great, I can't focus on the whole of my life being me walking through the space of my gift because the great men are on the other side. I want to be among the great men. The whole purpose and plan that God has put over my life is not for me to keep walk through the gift, 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 and die. That's not the whole point. <laughs> and the Lord brought confirmation. <laughs> That is the part of the verse that blows my mind. We always look at this verse and we want to be the person whose gift made the room and we walk through it. But what about the great men? I don't know about you, I want to be great. So it's a great thing with how the great men get there. You see, what happens with this relationship, it is a cyclical thing, it's beautiful. You, your gift expands, you makes the room, you're expanded, you walk through, you encounter great men. Now the great men have been doing what you did over and over and over and over. They have made their gift, they, they have expanded with their gift, they have walked through the space and they encountered great men. And those great men that you will find yourself in contact with, watch this, touch show you how to sharpen your gift further. So now, the expanded version of you expands that much more because they're now showing you how to become accustomed to the growth, the constant life of your gift growing and expanding you so that now the next space that your gift creates is bigger than the one you just walked through because you've been counseled by great men. When your gift brings you around great people, listen to them. Anytime your gift makes room for you and you walk through and you're in that space, look around. You won't be there by yourself. I mean, you're special, but you ain't that special. <laughs> there are going to be great men, then who, great men there who have done that 5, 6, 8, 10, 25 times over. And they are going to be there to give you the tips and the cues and the clues on how to continue to make the gift. Boom, space, walk, 
Space, boom, walk, space, boom, walk. You're doing it in rhythm. You're not thinking about it, you're not worried about it because they are counseling you on how to make a lifestyle of this supernatural encounter. And eventually, because we don't live forever, there will come a point in time where you have walked through the space that your gift has provided so often. The space has been provided. You've mastered and excelled at walking through this gift in such a way that you, it is now time for you. I don't have a chair, I don't need one. I'll use the step. It's now time for you to take your seat among the great men. And now it's time for you to sit among the great men and usher other people in and teach other people how to use the gift when they walk through that space and teach other people and the next generation how to manage being expanded and walking consistently in a, in a mind space, in a spirit of exponential expansion. When you're tied to your gift, all you're worried about is the space that it makes. It says a man's gift makes room for him. I don't see anything great about the first half of that passage. The word great is not there. The greatness is on the, the second part of that, which is, and brings him before great men. You've reached the, the level of great where God is bringing people to you. And your job, your purpose in that moment, as you have mastered the, the cycle of walking through the greatness and the great expanse that is created by your gift, your job is to now counsel others to do the same. Every time you walk through a space, somebody's going to be there until it's time for you to take your seat. And that is when we are great, truly great. It's not enough to just do the gift well. It's not enough to be excellent at just the gift. And this is why we cannot be great if we have associated ourselves literally as the gift. Earlier in the first uh, portion of the message, I talked about how the whole point of Samson was to open and make a way for Israel to escape the hand of the Philistines, to open and to make a way. That is the greatness of our lives with our gift. It is to open and make a way. You are not your gift. Not because you are not worth your gift, but because who God has made you to be is so much greater than your gift. In fact, you have more than one gift. And if you're so married to the one gift and how it is making space, there are other people, great men, who have navigated how to expand and express multiple gifts. So they're creating multiple spaces. They're not just creating one big hole. They're creating giant spaces in the universe for you, for them, and generations to be ushered through. So, I'm kind of glad I went to that stage of reading, <laughs> read that craziness. I promise you I'm a changed person for it. And I just pray that everyone here is the same. Be great. Be greater than your gift because that is who you are. Everyone stand. One of the things I called for in terms of really coming into contact with your gift is to check in with God. Say, God, are you with me? And I want to encourage anyone who is here right now. This is the portion of our experience where as a people, we look on the inside and we see what needs to be dealt with because God has created the space and the opportunity to do so.
first people I want to call to this altar, if you know, if you know that you have become so intertwined with your gift that you don't know who you are outside of it, if you have allowed the frequency of the use of your gift to determine your worth, Please come down to this altar because we need to break that off right now. Right now. Right now. Next group of people. I'm, I'm, I'm. <clears throat> burned on to call. If you do not know who you are outside of the gift and you want to start the journey to finding out who you are, to establishing a whole and supernaturally magnificent relationship with your gift, if you want to start that relationship and open yourself up to God right now, come on down. Supernatural communication with God, come on down. If you haven't had that constant communication with God about your gift, come on down. If you know you need to talk to God more about your gift, if you have stewarded and shepherded your gift on your own, in your own power, in your own strength, according to your own imagination and not to him, and you want to start today, come on down. Last group of people I want to call, if God has caused you to expand with your gift on the inside of you, and your gift has gone forth and you've made the space, but you saw the space and you thought the space was greater than you were in that moment, let's break that lie. Come on down. Walk through the space. Walk through it. Walk through it. God created that space for you to walk through specifically for you. Walk through it. Come on down. Last group of people, if you want to start a relationship with God, if you know in your heart right now that your relationship is with God is either non-existent or not where you want it to be. If you want that deep, deep relationship with God where he reveals the mysteries of the deep to you, where he can call you his child and you can receive him as your father and know the power of what that is. If you want to start that relationship, take those first steps right now and come on down. Come on down. I've done the walk. I'm standing here now because I took the steps. Trust me, I know. Come on down. Come on down. Mm. Heavenly Father, we are so enamored with you and we are so in love with you in this moment right now. You truly are the one to make a way out of no way. You truly are the one, Father God, to, to tap into and to speak to. So Father God, from this moment, we break the lie off of us that we are our gift in the name of Jesus. And in breaking that lie off of us, we offer our gift to you. This moment, we begin the journey, we begin the process of continuously surrendering our gift to you. And we pray, Father God, that you reveal the mysteries of the deep to us. Father, we pray right now that we have the relationship with you that the greats before us had with you, that Abraham had with you, where you withheld no thing from him, that Moses had with you, Father God, where he spoke mouth to mouth with you. We want that relationship now so that we can steward this precious gift that is inside of us. And Father God, we ask for a deepening, ever deepening revelation of who we are outside of our gift. Who have you purposed and planned for us to be, Lord God? Continue to reveal that to us. Father, soften our hearts. And Father, let us receive 
the grand vision that you have for us, let us receive it knowing that we are worthy because you gave it to us. Let us receive it knowing that we are qualified because you placed us here. Let every qualification we need, Lord God, be met by, are you with us? So we thank you, Lord God, for the awakening of deeper knowledge about our gifts and our talents, deeper knowledge about who we are, Lord God, as your children, as your servants, as your people, and as representatives of the kingdom. Father, let us continue to deeply, deeply understand what it is to be a reflection of who you are. I am that I am. Father, let us be as we be. From this moment forward, we are not our gift because our gift is in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen.